morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of Mercy, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's great. I see the women of joy here, and even a few men snuck in. This is beautiful. And so, uh, but it's awesome to, to be back when it takes me longer to distribute Holy Communion on a weekday than it does most Masses on Sundays in Massachusetts. And so um, keep the faith strong. Um, I'm Father Chris Alar. I'm one of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception up at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And uh, for me, this is always special to come back because I was a St. Mark parishioner from 2000 to 2006. And then the Lord, I had a business in Davidson, uh, engineer by degree, uh, got my MBA from University of Michigan, went on, started the business, uh, was on Lake Norman. My house was on the other side of Lake Norman. I drove my boat to work. It was just, this is a beautiful place, you guys. This is a beautiful place. If I wasn't a priest, this is where I would live. I've even asked my superior, can we get a parish down in Huntersville, North Carolina? Um, it's beautiful. And I was engaged to be married. Uh, I used to bring the young lady. She would sit, we would sit right there in that back corner. Um, engaged to be married. And then the Lord called and and uh, realized it was a greater it was a greater calling, and so um, uh, I'm just blessed so much by the Lord, and and a, a, to be part of this is so important, especially now in this the year of mercy, right? This is the year of mercy, so important. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to do two short talks. The first talk is only going to be half an hour, and then we'll do a quick break, and then we'll finish with another about a half hour talk. So I'm going to try to give you a four to five hour Saturday seminar in two half hour talks, okay? So you can't yell at me when I talk too fast. I'm trying to get so much information for you in such a short period of time, okay? So divine mercy, what, what is divine mercy? What do you need to know about it? And what is our Holy Father telling us, especially today, right? Okay, <clears throat> first of all, if I was to ask you, what is mercy, what would most of you say? You'd say it's compassion, it's, um, it's love, it's whatnot. But what's more important is understanding the roots of it. And when it's divine, even becomes more special. Now, I'm going to give you some things on divine mercy I promise you've never heard. So please don't sit there and say, all right, I already know all of divine mercy. Uh-uh. Because Father Seraph and I have been working 100-hour weeks, and we're creating a whole new presentation on going back into the writings of St. Faustina, going back into the scriptures, and we're presenting it new. I promise you there are things you're going to learn today new that you did not know. So don't worry about saying, I already know everything, because this is going to be some new information, I think, for you, some of it. Okay, so to kind of preview what divine mercy is, mercy is... Compassion, as I said, it's, it's, it's treating others with kindness. All that's true. But what's the highest virtue? Love, right? There's many, many virtues. The highest virtue is love. Now, is all love the same? No way. There's many, many modes of love. So here you have many, many, many virtues. At the top is, is the love. Now within love, you have many, many modes of love. The top mode of the top virtue is mercy. Mercy is a particular mode of love. It's the highest mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. It's the highest mode of the highest virtue. Now, it's taking, as Father Kosicki says, taking pains in your heart for the pains of another and taking pains to do something about that pain. That is mercy. <clears throat> Sounds like a lot of pain. Now, we're going to equate it to the Trinity. Within the Trinity now, there's perfect love, right? Perfect love. But when that love, as I said, if you were here at the homily, were most people here for the homily, talked about what is the Trinity, the love, the Father is the lover, 
the Son is the beloved, and the love between the Father and the Son is so great, it generates a third person, that's the Holy Spirit. That's why the family is a mirror of the Trinity. The husband is the lover, the wife is the beloved, and the love between them is so great, it generates a third person, the child. You can't have that between two men or two women. And that is just the way it is. We still love them. We still embrace them. We still care for them. But it's not God's plan for marriage was to be a mirror of the Trinity. And that is openness to the fruitfulness of life. So when that love within the Trinity overflows outside of itself, you have mercy. Now, mercy comes in three great acts of God. There's three great acts of God that we refer to as the three great merciful acts of God. So now, if the mercy between the, or I'm sorry, the love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit overflows outside of itself, what would you guess is God's first great act of mercy? Who said it? Creation. Because the love of God, which was perfect for all eternity, flowed outside of itself, we have creation. All right? Now, if that's the case, we now have something that involves us. Mercy is when that love of God overflows outside of itself and we have creation. Now, what person of the Trinity do we normally attribute Father, Son, or Holy Spirit creation? The Father. The Father. So, in the first great act of mercy, the first person of the Trinity created. I'm not going to get technical today, but there's one part I want to throw in here. I'm going to give you something I call four years of seminary in four minutes. This took me the third year to Christology before I saw the whole picture in seminary. There is one concept in our faith. Don't worry, I'm not going to get too technical here, but I want to hit this one part. There's one concept in our faith by Thomas Aquinas that summarizes our entire faith. It's a circle. What is that? Anybody know the Latin term for that? All comes from God. All will return to God. It's called exitus reditus. All comes from God. All will return to God. Now this is critically important. Four years of seminary and four minutes. Now, if you have God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right up here. And the first great act of mercy is all creation comes from him. We now have Adam and Eve, right? What happened next? It took them all of 10 minutes to fumble the football, right? I'm from Detroit. We haven't had anything to cheer about since Barry Sanders. He never fumbled the football, ever. Adam and Eve fumbled the football. What happened? They sinned, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. Actually, the sin wasn't their greatest problem. It's what they did after. But after God the Father in the first great act of mercy created, Adam and Eve got broken. So now, in the second great act of mercy, the second person of the Trinity came down in the second great act of mercy. Anybody know? Redemption. God's second great act of mercy. Now, is all of mankind redeemed? Yes or no? Is all of mankind redeemed? Yes! But will all of mankind be saved? No. Christ died for every one of us. Every person who ever lived or ever will live has been redeemed. But will every person be saved? No. No. Because we have to choose that gift. We have to accept it, right? Okay. God the Father, first great act of mercy, creation. May Adam and Eve, mankind got broken. In the second great act of mercy, the second person of the Trinity comes down in the second great act of mercy, redemption. 
Now, in the third and the final and the greatest act of mercy, guess who? Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, Christ through his sacrifice on the cross will reconcile all of creation through the power of the Holy Spirit back to God the Father for all eternity to enter into eternal life. We call this third and final great act of mercy sanctification, or in the East, divinization. In the third and the final and the greatest act of mercy, the Holy Spirit will return us all back to God the Father for all eternity. Now I ask you, when does this happen? Any guesses? Baptism. I heard baptism. That's a great guess. Because the Bible tells us we are divinized at our baptism, right? We become adopted sons and daughters of God. I heard somebody else say, when we die. Another great answer. When we die, we enter into the beatific vision, right? We enter into heaven, we hope. But where does it happen every minute of every day somewhere around the world? The Mass. The Mass. This is divine mercy. Now let's talk about this for a minute. I always tell my seventh, you know, I used to have the seventh grade catechism right here at St. Mark's. And, and that's where I began my catechism career. <laughs> Before I even went to the Marians. And oh, it's funny because I saw a couple of the, the kids that I had as seventh graders and they're all grown and grown up now. It's, 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 it's hilarious. It's awesome. And so anyway, in this, we have everything. Everything. Our entire faith is wrapped up in that concept. Now, I asked those seventh graders when I was here. I'm going to ask you guys, the parents of those seventh graders. Why did Jesus die on the cross? For our sins. True. But he could have forgiven our sins from heaven. What else? He loves us. True. But he could have loved us from heaven. To save us. True. But he could have saved us from heaven. These are all true. To show. Now we're getting warmer. By becoming a man and taking on our sufferings, no greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for another. Warmer. Mercy is all of it's under mercy. Warmer. Ah, justice, we're getting closer. <laughs> all right. Here it is. The penalty for sin is death. The penalty for sin is death. When you sin and I sin, we deserve to die. Now, I told my seventh graders, they're old enough to understand. Guys, I want to ask you a question. Don't ever do this. But whatever, what happens if you commit a terrible crime? And they all said you get arrested. Yeah. Then what? They all said you go to jail. You're forgetting something. What's in between? You go before the judge. All right? Now, I want you to all picture this. You're in a courtroom. You have committed the worst possible crime. What is the worst possible crime? Sin. A sin is a crime against God. It's the worst possible crime. It's a sin is a crime. It's a crime against God. You're there. You're in that courtroom. And you're before the judge. And the judge says to you, you're guilty. Now, every one of us could be in that position or would be, will be in that position. Every one of us will be in that position. We've all sinned, all of us, right? Now, you're there, you're before the judge. The judge looks at your rap sheet. On mine, they need a U-Haul truck with all those papers stacked up like the uh, tax forms. And they're going to come in and my rap sheet's going to be a mile long. This is why we go before the judge and ask for mercy. Now, why is mercy important? Mercy is super important. I'm going to explain to you through the Mass. 
Now, you look at the judge, and the judge says to you, you have done this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Your penalty is death. You again, I again, deserve it. So as you're getting ready to be sentenced to death, eternal death, what's eternal death? Hell. All of a sudden, in through the back door walks a man in a robe, long hair, beard, sandals. You've only seen pictures of him. You've never seen him, but you've seen pictures. You've heard about him. He comes up, gives you a look of love, stands next to you at the stand, and he says, Your Honor, I will die in this, or I will accept this person's penalty. I will accept this person's penalty. Now, everything's done and good now, right? Uh Uh-uh. Because the judge has to look at you. This is where the Protestant brothers and sisters have it right. And the judge says to you, do you accept this? It can't happen if you don't accept it. So our Protestant brothers and sisters have it right. I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Now, this man standing next to you gives you this look of love and says, Your Honor, I will die, or excuse me, I will take this person's penalty. So the judge says, you will die in this person's place. Yes, turns to you. Do you accept this? First of all, who in their right mind would not accept this? Don't laugh. We do it every time we miss Sunday Mass. What did the scripture parable say about the king that threw the wedding feast? And he said, go invite all those people to my wedding. There are people who want to come, and there's people who don't. What did the parable say that that first man that was invited to the wedding said? Does anybody remember? I'm too busy. I just bought a plot of land. I got to go look at it. Consider me excused. Then to the next one, he says what? They ask him, he says, I just got married. I am so busy with my new wife. Consider myself excused. Then he goes to the third one. He says, I just started a new business. That was me. I was working 80, 100 hour weeks, crazy. Seven days a week, 15 hour days. I didn't go to mass. I had no idea what I was doing to myself. But yet I was that third man in the parable that said, I just bought a new business. Consider me excused. What did the king do? The king was enraged. And he said, throw these out into the fire and bring in those who want to be here. Go to the highways and the byways and bring them in, right? This is what's going on. This is the mass, this is the wedding feast, and this is the king, the judge, who is saying, wake up. Now, the judge asked you, do you accept this gift? Of course you're going to say yes. But we don't. We're too busy with all our other things, especially our football on Sunday and all that. Well, maybe not you guys, but the husbands of you guys, right? Now, The judge says to you, okay, you accept this gift. You say, yep. He says, okay, everybody meet back here Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12. Or what time are masses here? (laughs) What happens every morning, Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12? The mass. This is the mass. This is what's happening. Now, what's the difference between Christ paying your debt and somebody like Maximilian Kolbe? Now, Maximilian Kolbe died for another guy, right? The Jewish man with the family. What's the difference? Maximilian Kolbe died for one man. Jesus died for every one of us. This is why, now this is not church teaching. This is not doctrine. This is my personal belief. My personal belief, don't write the bishop. Bishop Peter's really nice. He probably wouldn't yell at me anyway. I believe personally Because science teaches us, you all know how many people live in the world today? Seven and a half billion. Does anybody know how many people that science guesses have lived since the beginning of time? Any guesses? 110 billion. That's what science estimates the number of people who've lived from the beginning of time. Now let's suppose the world ended today. There's a tradition in the church that says the world will end when the number of souls that gets into heaven replaces the number of angels that fell at the time of the fall. When Satan fell, the scriptures tell us a third of the angels fell with him, right? 
Tradition with a small t teaches us that when the number of souls of us get into heaven to replace the number of angels that were lost at the fall, that's when the world will end. Anyway, let's suppose that's tomorrow. Tomorrow the world will end. If that's the case, Jesus died for every one of us who ever lived, whether we take it, the gift, or not. If that's the case, I want you to think of this for a minute. If you were crucified, if they brought in 100, 200 crosses right now and lined them up across the property, and each one of us were nailed to a cross, you would only feel your pain. I would only feel my pain. You would only feel your pain. We wouldn't feel each other's pain physically. We feel it in one way through the body of Christ, but not physically. You would only feel the nail being driven into your wrist for your particular wrists. I believe Jesus felt the pain 110 billion times greater than we would. Because he died for every one of us, so he had to feel that pain of dying for every one of us to redeem every one of us. So I personally believe he felt the pain 110 billion times greater. Or if there's 300 billion that live to the end of the world, 300 billion times greater. That's just my own personal belief. Now, Jesus accept, or he offers that gift whether we accept it or not. Now, when I was up at my company on Davidson, I used to have a fallen away Catholic named Ed who used to report to me. He is a really good man. He's not a Catholic anymore. And... I used to have the crucifix over my seat. Now, we're less than 50 people, which is the key number if you own a business, to avoid a lot of the laws legally. So I had that crucifix above my chair. Nobody could tell me I had to take it down. I started the company, founded it, all that. One day, Ed's sitting in front of me, and he's looking up. I can see he's getting fidgety, and he's looking up at my cross, and he's getting fidgety. And I'm like, Ed, what's the matter? He says, can I talk to you, Chris? I'm like, okay, he shuts the door. He says, why do you Catholics keep re-crucifying Christ? He is not on the cross. He is risen, Chris. Wake up. You Catholics don't get it. I was a Catholic until I saw the light. How many times have we heard that? I saw the light. Jesus is not crucified anymore. He is risen. Why do you crazy Catholics keep putting him back on the cross? Now I ask you, every Sunday that you come in here, do we keep putting Christ back on the cross? Sure seems like it to me. We're re-crucifying, we're going through the sacrifice, we're doing all this and that, right? No! We are not re-crucifying Christ. Why? Why? Anybody know why? God is outside of time. There is no time for God. Time was created for us. For God, there is no past. This sounds weird. There is no future. Everything for God is one big eternal now. If this is salvation history, if this is Adam and Eve and this is the end of the world... God sees all of it at one instant. There is no time for God. That sounds like a lot of our lives, doesn't it? There is no time for God. God is outside of time. Therefore, there's no past. There's no future. Let me give you an example. How was Mary immaculately conceived? Through the merits of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how Mary was immaculately conceived. How can that be? He wasn't born yet. When Mary was immaculately conceived, Jesus Christ hadn't even been born. Yet it was from the merits of his passion, which hadn't happened yet, his death, which hadn't happened yet, and his resurrection, which hadn't happened yet, are the merits by which Mary was immaculately conceived. How is that possible? Because God is outside of time. There is no time for God. He's all experiencing it at one instant. 
when you come into the Mass, we are not re-crucifying Christ. You are at Calvary. You are present at the crucifixion. Pope Benedict, if you haven't read Spirit of the Liturgy, please do. He tells us that when you walk in the back door of that church, you are present at Calvary. You are there as he's paying your debt. Now remember, the judge told you that you got to come back Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12 to work out all the details. You're there in the courtroom. The judge says that. In order to work out all the details, you got to come back. We all parties got to come back Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12. Jesus came back. He's here. He's ending up with his end of the bargain. Do you? They was. Do we? We have to come. We are at Calvary as he is paying our debt. But you got to be present to win. As baptized Catholics, this is the way God chose for us for salvation. Now, yes, a pygmy in the rainforest or somebody in Saudi Arabia where Christianity is illegal can't be judged on whether or not they went to Catholic Church, Catholic Mass. Why? Because it's illegal in Saudi Arabia and a pygmy in the rainforest never heard of it. God judges them how? He judges them differently than us. He judges them by the natural law. Not us. We're baptized Catholics. We will be judged on whether or not we accepted his gift of the church and the sacraments to do his will and to receive. Hey, wait, think about this. If your body needs a shower, which it does, right? You go and you clean it. Hopefully, we all take showers. If our bodies are dirty and need showers and need cleaning, why do we not think our souls do? That's confession. You have to eat, right? Every one of you is going to eat. Well, maybe not today. It's Friday, so we might fast. But we eat. If our bodies need food, why do we not think our souls need food? Our souls need food in the Eucharist. Now, the important thing is, at the Eucharist, there's a consummation of the wedding. Who's the groom? Jesus. Who's the bride? The church. Who's the church? We are. So when you come to Holy Communion, what happens on the wedding night? The bride and the groom become one. The groom enters into the bride. This is what happens when you come every moment to Holy Communion. Jesus, the groom, enters into you. It's consummated. This is the wedding feast of the Lamb. Pope Benedict tells us in the Spirit of Liturgy, when you walk in the back doors of the church, you are present at Calvary as he is offering that sacrifice. But you got to be there. Then the mystics tell us that the roof of the church opens up at every Mass and the angels and the saints ascend and descend and are united with us. The mystics tell us that at the moment of consecration, all your guardian angels come forward and kneel around the altar. And they're holding a vessel. Guess what's in that vessel? What you put into it. Now don't make your guardian angel the sad guardian angel. <laughs> that's got nothing in his vessel. We see him every day at Mass, chomping on their gum, looking at their watch. I got to get out of here. Is this over yet? There ain't nothing in those vessels. Those guardian angels are up here with empty vessels. You put everything you got into that vessel and bring it up to the sacrifice of the Mass. Every joy, suffering, pain, sorrow, good thing, bad thing, everything you put in there. It drives me nuts when people say, I don't go to Mass because I don't get anything out of it. The Mass is not about your entertainment. I'm not going to juggle and ride a unicycle. It's not about your entertainment. It's about you coming and giving worship to God here in the way he set up for us. When we say we're going to do it our way, I don't need church, I don't need the mass, I go right to God, I don't need confession, I go right to God. Really? All right, let's look at this for a minute. Confession. When you walk in that confession, I heard confessions today. Do I forgive your sin? Does the priest forgive your sin? Yes! Yes! God the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, 
I absolve you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not a general confession. You can't, that's not, or general absolution. That's not general absolution. You just not, did not meet your Lenten obligation. That was not general absolution. The priest forgives your sins. Why? He was given that authority at his ordination. Not because I did anything to deserve it. If anything, I've done everything to the contrary. It's not because the priest merited in any way. But what did Jesus say in the upper room? John chapter 20, verse 21. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. So, when you hear the priest say, I absolve you, your sins are guaranteed forgiven, or Jesus is a liar. And Jesus is not a liar. Okay? Jesus said, whose sins you forgiven will be forgiven in heaven. How powerful is that? How much authority does the church have that we just don't even care about? Why can that, why does the priest have the power to forgive your sins? Because when you have ultimate authority, you have the power to delegate it. Jesus had ultimate authority. He had the power to delegate it. And he did to his church. When I had my business, I remember when I had to go on business trips, I would be walking out the door and I would say, Brian, while I'm gone, you are in charge. While I'm gone, if there's a bill to pay, you pay it. If there's a call to return, you return it. If there's a contract to negotiate, you negotiate it. If there's a person to hire, you hire. If there's a person to fire, you fire. I will honor it. Brian did nothing. He put no money into the business. He wasn't there when it started. He didn't take the risk. He did nothing to merit it. But because I had ultimate authority, I had the power to delegate it to him. Same with Jesus. Jesus had the ultimate authority to forgive sins. He delegated that to his priests. So when the priests forgive you, you are guaranteed forgiveness or Jesus is a liar. And we know that is not true. This is why we need the church. This is the way he mapped out for us for salvation. It's the same with the Eucharist. He chose this method to feed us spiritually. Who are we to tell him he's wrong? But we do it every day. So at the Mass, when you come in, Christ is on the cross at Calvary. We're not recreating it. Mass is not a representation, or a representation. It's a representation. Mass is you being present at Calvary as Jesus is paying your debt. Oh my. Okay. I'm out of my first time. I haven't even got to the good stuff yet. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break. Just let's try to do five minutes or so. Just take a quick break. We got some material out on the table. Divine Mercy. If you have to leave right now, I have a DVD and a CD out there with my talk that covers a lot of this. It's even better. Go out, grab that if you want. If it's a $10 donation. If you can't afford it, take it though. Whatever you can give if you want. If you don't have any money, please just take it. Take it. Share this with your family. We'll break for five minutes, but you need to come back because we're going to talk about how all of this applies to the year of mercy and what you need to do to receive the graces that Jesus promised on Divine Mercy Sunday, okay? And the answer is going to surprise you. I promise you, you've never heard it. I promise. God bless you. Let's meet back in five minutes, okay? <laughs>